Land Use Committee meeting together from for Sioux Falls, South Dakota on uh, today, the 30th of, May, of July. I wish it was the 30th of May. We could have a couple months back and get, get a few more things done. But uh, welcome everybody here in the uh, uh, Carnegie Town Hall and those of you that are visiting us on uh, Channel 16. Uh, and we have a full committee here together, so uh, we'll continue on with our business. Um, I would entertain a uh, motion to uh, approve the minutes of uh, Tuesday, May 29th and June 26th. So move, Anderson. Second. Karski. Any, uh, any questions or uh, alterations or anything? Okay, all in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. We have uh, three items on the agenda today. Um, and the first one is with uh, Mr. Jeff Smith, City Planning on the Annexation Program Update. Jeff. Good evening. Thanks for being here. Certainly. We were here about a year ago for annexations. And the purpose of this is to give you an update again to the annexation program. As this slide states, it's really trying to work with not only City Council, the public, but the people within rural areas outside the City of Sioux Falls on how and when land will be annexed in the City of Sioux Falls. Last year, when we came and spoke to this group, it was that we put an annexation program together, and that's out on the website along with a map. It's a large document that talks about state law, city ordinances, <coughs> and it explains our whole policies on how we do annexations. I'm going to give a quick summary on that. But we talk about with annexations, given a specific timeline, uh, a limit, time frames, costs and benefits, impacts, and the related processes. In the background, okay, in the past we've done really some significant annexations. Orchard Heights back in 78, Norton Froelich in 79 through 82, three year time frame, um, and then the Hayward in 1984. That's just some of the annexations that we've done. <coughs> now again, as I mentioned, back in August of 2011, um, we did seven different annexations up to 2003, and we have 50 different annexation areas that we have hanging out there that we want to try to accomplish between 2012 and 2035. The City of Sioux Falls Ordinance also complies with State Law 9-4, basically that says we need to conduct a study you need to identify the resources to this, and it has to comply with your adopted comprehensive plan. But those are the things that, again, that you go back to. What's your framework for doing annexation? And again, so I don't want to assume anything here. Annexation is taking land from outside the city limits and bringing it into the city limits, whether it's Minnehaha County or Lincoln County, but property that's outside city limits and bringing it into the city limits. Reasons for annexations. In the annexation program, we talk about four different reasons. Really that there's people residing outside the city that enjoy many of the benefits of being outside or being part of the city, but they don't pay for those services. Um, if urban services inevitably be, are required by those residences, um, and so they should help uh, be part of those services. There should be one local government that best serves those residents, and right now we have a lot of examples where they don't. And without annexation of fringe areas, there's not orderly and planned growth of the city of Sioux Falls. Our growth areas, since 2008, 2009, when we put the comprehensive plan together, we show that there's a tier one, two, and three for our growth areas, and we talk about in those tiers an urbanized a plan in a future growth area. So again, we start to show people how we're planning and developing our areas. This map is very busy, but it's also on the website where you can really zoom in and look at it, but it starts to at least explain to people. Um, what we have here is the red is the eminent areas, and then again, the yellow is less to orange to green is the long range. The little black dots are all of the single family residences either next to the city of Sioux Falls or outwards in Minnehaha and Lincoln County, and then the lines are our capital improvement programs but it starts to show from a quick blush people can look at going, okay, so is my property being looked at for annexation? You can see whether it's red, it's hot, we're looking at it right now, or no, you know, really, it's a long-term annexation. And there's two of them that we're gonna talk about today, Prairie Meadows on the west side of town and Cactus Heights in the northeast part of town. 
When we look at planning and implementation of annexation, we want to look at utilities, specifically sanitary sewer, arterial streets, water, and storm sewer. The court case that everybody bases things on in South Dakota is the um, Rapid City case where Smith was annexed and they went against Rapid City and said you can't forcibly annex this. The Supreme Court ruling said that the people and property owners of an area proposed for annexation have neither the moral nor the legal right to stand aloof from an outside community. They need to be part of this community. And so that's the Supreme Court ruling for the state of South Dakota that says you can't stand apart from a community. We have a lot of goals to reduce the controversy on forcible annexation. What it really comes down to is you have to have patience from both sides, you have to have time frames, and it's a communication aspect. So what we're going to talk about here is not something that we're going to be doing tomorrow or next week, but over the next couple of years talking about annexation. Then we don't do this discriminatory. We don't go out there and force annexation and just say just because. But we have a process to go through and people can understand the process. When we look at annexation by waves, we look at these six different criteria. What <coughs> growth tier are they in? Are they consistent with their county's comprehensive plan? What's the ability to meet the state's contiguity requirements? What about the infrastructure? What about the existing land use and what's the cost benefit? So not only can city council look at their criteria, but the citizens can go. So you just didn't pick us out of the hat. No, there's criteria that we look at. Now with these two annexations and any future annexations, we'd like to take care of them over a, basically a two to four year time period so that when we bring the annexations forward to you, we bring them all forward with the same city council body. It doesn't make a lot of sense to start with one city council, be in the middle of it, have a new city council come into play, and then have to end it with another city council. So with these city councils, we're going to start with a resolution of consideration somewhere between August and January. Then we're going to do the resolution of intent between August 2013 and January 2014, and end up with the resolution of annexation in October to March of 2014. So that's how long each one of the annexations takes place. But we'll start now with one annexation and we'll work it through over the next two years. Now here's the two annexations. The first wave was with Prairie Meadows. They're in the first wave. Again, as I mentioned, Prairie Meadows is on the southwest part of town. It's at 41st Street and T. Ellis Road. Um, it's in the first wave because it's eminent. We need to annex them. They do understand this. We've met with them two to three times. They're on the south side of 41st Street. Um, my expectation is not for you to understand or read this right now. It's pretty fine detail, but we go through each one of the criteria on what their urban infrastructure is, what growth tier they're in, in, and then in the end what it comes down to is the annexation study including a drainage and infrastructure cost study leading to annexation in the next two years. So that's what we're trying to do with Prairie Meadows is over the next two years really complete this study. Now for example South Cactus Heights in the northeast part of town same type of criteria we've gone through the criteria it's in the program it's been out there for over a year because we presented this to you last year we've met with them i think sam's met with them maybe five or six times um, and the action in the end is enter into a pre-annexation agreement to allow sewer services to the area annexation should be delayed for at least 10 years but we'd create an agreement with them right now based upon some of the criteria that we have and with that Again, I just wanted to bring forward with you today that we're continuing to look at annexations. It's a huge issue, not only for these two annexations, but for the other 48 annexations that are out there. Um, you'd have at least three annexation <coughs> resolutions that would come before this body and the full city council over the next two years. You'd hear about the public meetings um, that would be direct sit downs in their neighborhoods with the neighbors. Um, as we work through this process. That communication, that time line is really what gets us to the end result. So. Thank you. Uh, just hold on. Any questions from the, yes. Yeah, Jeff, um, there's a couple of things that um, I noticed you didn't mention. First of all, you didn't mention property rights at all, private property rights. And those are in 
our U.S. Constitution, specifically in the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments, talking about life, liberty, and property. These are rights that U.S. citizens have. And besides not talking about private property rights, fundamental basis for this entire country, you didn't really say anything about citizens. Um, basically, what's going on here is a situation where the city wants more money, more power over territory, over people. Now, if people want to voluntarily be annexed into the Sioux Falls, that's great. I think it's fantastic. But going out and coercively doing this, I think, raises grave problems for property rights, especially, like I mentioned before, in the U.S. Constitution. And if you could please respond to this really important issue of property rights and giving citizens choice in whether they want to be annexed into the city of Sioux Falls. Certainly, the state Supreme Court's already ruled on that. They don't have a choice. The choice comes up to city council. And so what we would like to do as planning is bring that choice in front of city council. The challenge that we've had over time with these neighborhoods is they ask staff, are we going to be annexed or not? And we can't make that decision. It's not a, as a property right issue, it's not a, it's, it's not a planning staff decision whether or not they should be annexed or not. It's an elected decision. If we bring it forward to you as an elected body and you decide not to annex, we're fine with that. But if you decide to annex, then that's the decision that we move forward with. But see, officials in government, you know, especially elected officials, mm -hmm. we take an oath of office to support the U.S. Constitution, the state constitution, and also the city charter. I think it would be incumbent upon it, you know, employs the city also to try to do this too. And it looks like that we're just simply going to coerce these people. Oh. Well, we are, let's face it. If this passes the city council, this is just outright coercion for those people who do not want to be annexed. Now, once again, I have no objection to voting to have people become part of Sioux Falls because I think there's a lot of good things here. But if there are some people that do not want, I think it's appropriate we allow them to, you know, uh, we should adhere to their uh, decision that they want to remain outside the city and exercise their property rights. Councilor Anderson. Jeff, since uh, Prairie Meadows is the first wave and hmm? the one that it seems we're further along with, could you just explain the process? of like neighborhood meetings and discussions you've had with the people in those areas and, about the annexation. And I believe the council member can chime in a little bit here too. With Prairie Meadows, they're already hooked up to our sanitary sewer. They're already getting our services as an entity outside the city of Sioux Falls. They pay an ex a larger rate as an outside entity. Um, they would like to be the majority of them would like to be annexed in the city of Sioux Falls so they could get the discounted rate as a city entity. Um, they have drainage issues that they can't get addressed by their, by their entity as, a, as an improvement district because they're not part of the city right now. They're in a township that currently doesn't <laughs> cease to exist. Their township is broken down, so they don't have a township. They have nobody that fixes their roads or takes care of their roads. So right now, there's no one to take care of their roads, to take care of their drainage, to take care of their sanitary sewer, and they're on well water. Um, so the process is that we want to study what would it take for them to be an urban entity just like other neighborhoods with city water, city drainage, city sanitary sewer, and roads, and this would be the cost benefit and the impact to them, and we bring it in front of them as this body also and say, do you want to move forward with this or not? And if I may, you may, as we go forward with this, there will be more neighborhood meetings. Uh, there, there will be the, the uh, opportunity for people in those neighborhoods to speak to the council, correct? Absolutely, absolutely. We've had two with them already. Their questions usually, again, all these neighbors that call us, not just these two, but they're like, can't you at least give us some indication? Are you gonna annex us in a year or is it gonna be 50 years? And we go, well, let's have that public discussion. And they're like, that's what we want. We want to have that public discussion. Thank you. Yep. 
Councilor Karski? I think that, uh, Jeff, that answered the question that I had, uh, one of them anyway, about what kind of services are they getting and what kind of services are they asking for as part of this annexation. Uh, so we're not just going in and, and uh, confiscating land, so to speak. Um, I did have one question and um, another question. Um, if you could go back to the um, go back to the map of Sioux Falls that you had for the please you're jumping ahead. There you go. I notice that there are a lot of, maybe not a lot, but there are a number of isolated, shall I say, islands within the city of Sioux Falls. We're talking, the ones that you're talking about are all on the fringe. Um, what about these isolated or, or islands uh, that are there? Uh, what are we doing about those? Uh, that are you know caught up. I'm looking at the one, uh, you know. There's there's just a number of them. They're down really, to the south. You know what I mean? Yeah, there really aren't that many isolated in the city of Sioux Falls. I mean, if you look, you start at downtown, you work your way outwards. There aren't that many. You start, you, you get to the two that you could probably see on the southwest side of town. You have the red one at 69th Street and Louise Avenue, the Johnson property. We started that annexation probably four years ago. And we are still working with those property owners. It's across from the Heart Hospital, um, and we're still discussing that with that property owner. The other one, again, um, Council Member Karski, this is the Schildauer property at the southwest corner of 41st and Sertoma. Um, it's yellow. We would like to annex that property, but they're not interested in coming in. So again, you go back, that's fine. We would like to have that discussion if they don't want to be part of the development and be part of the city of Sioux Falls. We're not here to force people in. We want to have the public this conversation and make those determinations. If council says no, do have the annexation, then we proceed forward. So there aren't a lot of properties that we haven't at least started those conversations with. But we are in conversation with most of those people. Right. Why Prairie Meadows and Cactus Heights are the ones I brought forward for you is because both of those have a lot of residential development in houses that are coming to us. Those people come to us and say, we want to be annexed. We're having sanitary sewer and drainage problems. Would the city please give us a timeline and a cost benefit study? They're coming to us. Is this going to cost us some, uh, some money then? Uh, it's going to cost city? somebody a lot of money. Okay. At this point, until we get into the study over two years, we, we don't know for sure. Councilor Stage. Yeah, I was going to ask a question, Jeff. Uh, Jeff, do we have any ordinance that says uh, if people uh, outside of Sioux Falls, uh, like 50% or 60% do not want to be annexed, we just don't bother them? State law. Yep, okay. that's what the annexation program that I brought a year for. It's all laid out in state law. Yes, sir. Okay, so like Prairie Meadows, we want to really annex it. But if there are 50% of the people who don't want to be annexed, correct. we cannot annex them? That's correct. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Any other, oh, now we got some. I'm going to go uh, Karski first. Thank you, Rex. Uh, we, you mentioned a lot of money. And the way I understand it, when we annex in properties that are already developed, I mean, they got to pay to hook up to the sewer, pay to hook up to the water. We're talking substantial, ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars in some cases. Is correct. that correct? That's correct. And that's addressed at the public <coughs> meetings, so people are fully mm -hmm. aware of. And how are they expected to? I mean, do we give them a timeline to pay for that type of thing? How does that happen? We have that discussion with them. And again, each one of these is different. And that's really the challenge. It's not a cookie cutter where you go, and here it is. It's over five years and you just pay. It's, you look at how big the cost is and do they want, need sewer first and water? Do they not need water? You have to look at each one of the utilities and how they pay for it. Um, and then that's where you would have to come back before this body again and say, would you like to do 
an assessment that's over five years? Do you do a 10 year assessment or do you not do assess? We have to look at it at, a, at one incident and look at that one development. Um, but you are absolutely correct. When we talk to the property owners as well as with this council, you have to consider when people live in the city of Sioux Falls, when they buy that lot and that house, they buy that lot cost and it's very expensive because they have a city street improved with curb and gutter and sidewalks and a water stub and sanitary sewer. When they buy a residential lot, they don't have any of that. And so now they have to hook up a tall that and that's that 15 to $25,000. Okay. Councilor Anderson. Just one other quick question, I guess, on the east side as, as we're looking at Cactus Heights. Mm -hmm. um, Arrowhead Parkway and then that area to the south. <clears throat> Have there been any conversations as with that group of people or business people? Um, the, the large one to the east is Split Rock Heights, the yellow area. And we had large discussions with them back in 2008 and 2009 when we were trying to help them with sanitary sewer and they said they did not want to be annexed in and we said we will run the sanitary sewer in a different location but you have to understand that then your costs for future sanitary sewer hookups will be significantly more and we sent them <laughs> certified letters to every one of the property owners in that development and said based upon your decision to not have sanitary sewer in your neighborhood your costs for future annexations will be significantly greater. And I have all those letters still signed by certified letters um, in our files cabinets. Wasn't that going through the lake out there? Or right through their drainage way. With the lake that they have out in the middle of that? We were able to address it with the drainage areas. So. Right. Yep. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay. Further questions? Okay, thank you. Let's move on to uh, item B, Country Club Zoning. Thank you. This has been before you twice. Here's really the purpose and intent of this Country Club issue, okay? Even though everybody understands there's two Country Clubs in the city of Sioux Falls, there's no definition in our zoning ordinance for a Country Club. We want to allow the land uses as, de as defined, okay, and allow them within a zoning district, and then what accessory uses are allowed within there. So it's a really a three-stage approach. Can we define country clubs? That's pretty easy. Where are these land uses going to be defined? What zoning classification? And then what uses? So that's the process we're kind of walking through, okay? September 2011, we were here. May of 2012, the intent of the zoning ordinance is to allow the two country clubs within the RC Recreation Conservation District in a park setting based upon the existing uses they provide. Again, the country clubs that, again, I think people that go out there understand, I, I don't know. They have golf, swimming, tennis clubs, banquets, full service restaurants, retailing, and they have on sale alcohol. That's what they have. They're also proposing off sale alcohol. Now the background, there's Minnehaha and Westward Ho Country Clubs. Prairie Green, the city owned, isn't a country club, but they have a planned development zoning district that operates as a country club. Willow Run is a privately run planned development that is that fourth tier that isn't set up this way, but could, as I have it, programmed or developing. Then there's also Elmwood and Keene that are the fifth and sixth tier that, you know, again, you have to take them all into consideration. So the definitions, right now, it's underlined because this would all have to change. Country clubs would be a club characterized by certain membership qualifications. So I have a definition. We have a club definition. We have a golf course definition. So that's what we have right now, but we don't have a definition for what a country club is. Then where would those uses be allowed? Country clubs aren't allowed anywhere, so it's red. Private clubs are allowed in RD residential districts, but they have to go through a lot of public hearing process. However, in a commercial district, it's a green light. They can go in a private club in a commercial district. Golf courses, green light in RC. So red versus green. Where are they allowed? Where are they not allowed? And then again, as I just tried to put it, 
apples to apples. What uses are at these? Well, a private club, it doesn't have golf. It has a clubhouse and it has banquet rooms and they probably have a bar type setting. Golf courses, they have golf, they have a clubhouse. They don't really have a full service restaurant at a golf course, they serve fry orders and foodstuffs, that's how we define them. They have a banquet room, they have a pro shop. And again, now go all the way to the left side, country clubs have golf, clubhouses, full service restaurants, banquet rooms, bars. They have a pro shop retail, swimming, tennis. So those are the big three that I'm trying to do. Define it, where are they gonna be allowed, and what uses? And I know that's the big issue when we've come here. What do you want them to be allowed for? And I don't have a lot of argument there. I don't know what you want, and I'm not advocating one way or the other. I'm just bringing this item before you. Now again, you mentioned last time, because um, I wasn't here when Dave Loveland brought this before you, but there's city and state laws, and there's a new state law about carry out of partially consumed sealed bottle of wine. That's not what this issue is. Their issue from the country clubs is they do a clubhouse. They have, you know, they can buy golf balls and shirts. They want to just be able to sell liquor. If someone's there and goes, hey, we're leaving. Can we buy a bottle of wine? And they go, no. They go, why not? I can buy everything else here, but I can't buy a No, they can't buy off sale. This isn't a packaged liquor, sealed bottle of wine issue. Financial, I've worked with Minnehaha County. Um, the way the zoning setup does not impact their permits or licenses, their sales tax, their property tax. So that won't change how their taxes or licenses are. Again, it's definitions, zoning classifications, and land use. Now again, over the last year, I've really tried to research what other jurisdictions do, and there's not a clear-cut answer. Everybody does it a little bit differently. Um, Rapid City does define a country club and then allows them in different districts. Omaha doesn't define them as a country club. They do a recreation club and permits them in eight different districts. So I wanted to give you some flavor of what other jurisdictions do. And what I'm trying to do is define it as a country club, allow it in an RC, Recreation Conservation District, So in the end, any questions for me? But the zoning amendment would not change their assessed value, their tax rates, or their assessments, or any financial issues. It would allow them any time in the future, again, anybody would be able to come and say, can I be defined as a country club? Could I be allowed for these license permits or amendments as a land use in the city? It would have to go through a public hearing process, planning commission, city council, and that's how the process would work. But we'd have a definition for what a country club was what zoning district. Questions? I have a couple then, if no one else does. Um, I have a, not a problem with this, but what I, what I, my brain always goes off in all kinds of directions, like what if, what if, what if. And, you know, I don't want to see a, uh, a drive through one of our country clubs right. for a liquor store. And I think uh, I visited with Mike about this a little bit on how we could curtail, if that's the word, um, that type of potential operation um, in, in, at the country clubs or at the clubs or whatever we would decide would be the um, correct wording. Have you given any thought to that at all about how that could be done? It goes into the definition, how we define the country club, and then again, what uses you would allow. So. Kim, come with more, please. Um, how we have it set up right now is that the definition for country club, very towards the bottom, it says, having facilities for tennis, golf, swimming, full service restaurant, banquet space, meeting. So it would say, I mean, we could exclude it, or right now, since it's not listed, I mean, drive throughs are not allowed, it's not listed. Or you would say, excluding, they can't do, I mean, you could be that specific also, and you would define what things are not allowed in the definition. Okay. And again, that's the direction I'm kind of, I mean, I want to define them so people understand, and right now, since it's not defined, you don't. Yeah, and that's, that's the challenge we've had over the past is, they come in, they go, what do you mean we're, I mean, we've been here all this time, you don't have a definition for us? Well, how do you know we can't do a 
uh, gift shop. It's just because we've never defined it. We don't have a pro shop listed. We don't have dining rooms out there either. We should list, you know, tennis, swimming, banquet halls. And then where do you want it to start and stop? That's really the direction I'm, I need. Yes, Councillor Anderson. That's the perfect answer there, Jeff, is where are we going to start and stop? Yep. Because now we're going to be talking about indoor tennis facilities, indoor swimming, and those are going to be clubs too. And are those going to come and ask for alcohol sales and then off-premises alcohol sales? Um, that's where my concern is, is that we have, an, you know, we have an abundance of liquor stores and regular grocery stores that sell alcohol. You can get them almost on every street corner. And now we're going to allow people who may have already been drinking to be able to buy and purchase alcohol to drive off with. I, I, I've got some real major questions about this. Questions and direction? Concerns. Questions Just and direction. Major I mean, because again, we yeah. could go back to club then too and say, you know, are clubs not able to have on sale and off sale? Do well, you I want to set a clear. Yeah, and I'm not talking about on sale. I'm more concerned about the off sale. Okay. Because the off sale, now you're leaving with alcohol in your vehicle. You know, we've, we've been talking about all the, the DUIs and the cost of that and everything. Um, you know, now we're talking about a, giving more access to alcohol, even easier, and then allowing them to drive away with this alcohol. And I just... I have a problem with that. Anybody else? What is your proposal for, uh, for us? I can draft an ordinance um, and present it. The uh, country clubs are, are still uh, wanting this, in other words? It's been about a year. And again, threefold for them, but most importantly, they would like to because their requests from their customers are, can they have off sale? Everything else at this point, they're doing. Wishes of the committee. Well, I guess my, Mr. Chair, I guess my uh, desire would be to, to allow a lot of freedom and flexibility for these country clubs. Um, I guess I'm not anticipating that we're going to have a lot of people that are members of these country clubs going and buying the alcohol and getting in their car and drive off and on a drinking spree. I don't anticipate that. Thank you, Councillor Steggers. Any other comments? Okay, I'll uh, I'll ask you to come up with a with a uh, proposed okay. ordinance uh, with some of the paying attention to some of the concerns that we have here thank you and also um, perhaps limiting it a bit from the standpoint of um, people who are interested in the in the uh, liquor that they have partaken of during their meal, that kind of thing, rather than having a huge display and opening it up as a um, liquor store, so to speak, on their premises. I think that was the first way they brought it to us, as I remember. Um, you know, hey, that was a great glass of wine I had at, the, at dinner, or that was a, a good, buy, a good uh, scotch. Okay. Uh, what kind was it? Well, we have that on, on, uh, available for you to purchase on your way out. Uh, without having a, a huge display, um, you know, a liquor store there where they can shop on their way out um, uh, kind of situation. Um, maybe that would be the direction you'd want to kind of take a look at. Would anybody have any objections to that? And will that be brought back to the committee? Oh, then? yes, brought back here for, uh, before it's uh, taken to the council. Hearing none, why don't you do that? And when do you think you could be back? In a month, two months? I mean, 
We should be okay in a month or two. Yeah, that'll be fine. Thank you. Okay. Meeting adjourned. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no? Okay. <laughs> okay, we're going to take on a little bit of a dog uh, discussion here. We are uh, in good shape for time. And so um, what I'd like to do is ask... Um, uh, Mike Cowell to come forward and uh, visit with us a little bit about uh, what the um, animal control has found out. Uh, before we do that, what I want to do is to remind everybody that um, the way we like to work this, or the way I found that it works the best, is to um, get some expertise, some experts up here to talk about this. Um, we have um, Mike uh, Cowell from the um, Animal Control Supervisor and Corey Beatty from the Humane Society, and I believe she brought someone else along with her from one of the uh, rescue um, uh, people. Um, and we're going to listen to them first. Then we're going to discuss it a little bit around um, amongst ourselves and uh, see what we can come up with. And so there may or may not be any public input today. Uh, and uh, we'll see where we go with that depending on time, et cetera, et cetera. So just to let you know where we're starting from and where we go, that seems to work the best. So, Mike. Thank you, Counselor. Mike Colwell, uh, Animal Control Supervisor. Uh, basically, I just brought the Council some facts and figures of our current workload. <clears throat> basically, in 2011, Animal Control responded to 14,163 calls for service. Uh, if you look at the slide, you can tell that basically as the weather gets warmer, Mike, can I interrupt you real quick? Do you yes, have sir. this available for us, or is it, is it over there? Uh, I did not bring okay. a copy. Uh, as you can see by the slide, the workload increases uh, as the weather gets warmer over the summer months, uh, gets substantially higher, um, and that's when the majority of the call volume is experienced. Uh, of the 14,000 calls that were handled in 2011, 539 of those calls were initially classified as vicious dogs, dog bites, or animal attacks. That represents a 3.8% of all of the calls that were handled by animal control. When I say those calls were classified as vicious dogs, animal attacks, or dog bites, that means when the calls come into the dispatch center, that is how they get coded out. It doesn't mean that that is the uh, final result of that call after the officer investigates the call and handles it. In 2012, so far, we have responded to 6,966 calls for service. You can kind of see the same sweep as the weather starts to get warm, our call volume increases. So far in 2012, of those 6,900 calls, 295 calls, were initially classified as vicious dogs, dog bites, or animal attacks. This represents 4.2% total workload of the calls handled by animal control. Currently in the city of Sioux Falls, we have four dogs that are registered as vicious. Uh, there have been other dogs who have been declared as vicious, but have either been signed over by the owners to the city, uh, or the dogs have moved to a different location. I'd be happy to take any questions from the council uh, in regards to call volume, the vicious dogs that we have in the city currently. Councilor Staggers. Yeah, Mike, uh, I guess I was unfamiliar that we have four vicious dogs in Sioux Falls. What does that mean exactly? Basically, there's a city ordinance, 7-3, uh, that deals with vicious dogs. Um, if we declare, the police department declares a dog as vicious, there are a set of criteria that have to be met oh. for that person to retain ownership of that animal. Uh, if they meet all of those criteria, they are allowed to get their animal back. I see. And if they don't meet uh, the criteria, is the dog destroyed? or? If they don't meet the criteria, they would be uh, summoned into court 
and then a judge would make that decision, but ultimately we would be looking to euthanize the animal. Oh, okay, thank you. Councilor Karski. The little bit of homework I've done regarding the term vicious, it, there's only two people that, from what I understand, that can declare a, a dog vicious, and that's the police chief or a physician. Is that correct? That is how the city ordinance is written. Uh, it also defines the police chief as his designee yeah. and basically as the supervisor of animal control myself or Lieutenant Miller is actually normally the person that declares the dog as vicious. Good. Are there any standards, um, metrics that are used to determine, how do we say, well, that was vicious? Uh, basically, what I normally look at um, when I'm reading all the reports, all of the case reports that get generated by animal control come through my desk. Um, when I look at those dog bites or dog attacks that come across my desk, um, I'm looking for dog attacks, something that would be a protracted incident, not an incident where a dog uh, ran up and bit one time and then moved back to the residence. Uh, I also consider the amount of injury that the person sustained um, and just the overall behavior of the animal. Uh, the ordinance itself does give a definition for what would be considered as vicious. It does or does not? It does give a, a definition of what could technically be considered as vicious for the animal. Um, also in doing that uh, vicious declaration, we take into consideration the opinion of the animal control officers who respond to the call, talk to the victims, talk to the pet owners, and also see the animals themselves and what their demeanor is like. Kind of a hypothetical, I'm walking down a sidewalk and a, a dog comes out of the yard, it's not chained up, uh, not fenced in, and, and bites me or attacks me. Would that dog be considered vicious? The dog could be declared as vicious, um, depending on what your, as the victim, what your opinion of that would be, um, what the animal control officer observed, and the extent of the injury that you would have received um, based upon the dog bite. So as, as the person that's attacked by the dog, is my, am I asked, was that, do I have input into that decision? Yeah, we would take your uh, opinion into that decision. Um, it would all, all of those factors would get considered together as far as whether or not the dog would be considered vicious. And I guess my last question then, if you don't mind, is sure. it standard for, at least regarding this part, a standard protocol for that decision based on that, or do other communities have a more extensive protocol for determining that, you know, how, how, how to determine if a dog bite is vicious? I guess I couldn't speak to what other communities are currently using uh, as their standard for vicious dogs. That's how our ordinance is currently written, um, that it's up to the decision of those two people, like you mentioned, the chief of police uh, or a physician to address that uh, designation as vicious. And something else just came to my mind. Sure. What is the um, penalty for having a, a dog? Is there some fine, monetary? What is, if your, there your dog goes out and bites, what's, what's gonna happen? Uh, if your dog was running at large and bit someone, you could receive a ticket for running at large. That's a separate city ordinance. Um, currently, the, the fine on that could be $200. Um, I know that the city is looking at potentially coming more in line with the state of South Dakota and making the fine for class two misdemeanors $500. Um, but right now, what they would do is cite that person into court and they would let the judge uh, set the fine amount. Okay. Well, Councilor Anderson. Um, this will be for you to start with and then probably someone also from animal control. As you know, the city council has discussed changing the ordinance as far as how animals are handled in this type of a situation. Um, right now, as you see the ordinance as we have it, 
what changes would you suggest? I think that the ordinances that we have on the books are good ordinances. Um, I, I don't think that there's any sweeping changes that would need to be made. Um, like I stated, we only currently have four vicious dogs uh, in the whole city of Sioux Falls. I have a couple of other figures I could present to you. Uh, in 2010, there were 4,500 dog licenses issued in 2010. Um, dog licenses in the city of Sioux Falls are good for either one year or three years. So it's hard, it's difficult to give you an exact number of licensed dogs in the city of Sioux Falls, as well as the fact that there are several dogs in the city of Sioux Falls who are unlicensed. Um, in 2011, there was about 3,800 dogs that were licensed. And so far in 2012, there's been about 2,400 dogs that have been licensed in the city. Uh, the amount of actual dog bites or dog attacks that occur in the city represent only about three or four percent of our workload during any given month. Um, and we're handling about 14,000 calls every year. That's, that's pretty typical. So you're talking about something that's a, only about a three or four percent part of our workload that we're addressing with the ordinances that we currently have. Most of the citations that we write currently have a $95 fine, but all of the officers have the ability to cite someone into court where a judge would be able to find them the higher $200 amount. And for repeat offenders or significant events, that's what they utilize. They will actually cite that person into court instead of issuing the ticket for $95 and let the judge uh, issue the fine. And when uh, the discussion was talking about coming closer to the state and maybe having like a $500 fine and I don't know if there's some court time or jail time uh, that could be added to that, but is that something that you would look at as being maybe like a, a stage two or three, you know, with a dog who has a history? Uh, yes, uh, basically that's what they would use the citing the person into court would be an animal that they've had several contacts with, uh, irresponsible pet owners who repeatedly are unable to comply with what is required by the city. Those are the people that they're citing into court. They're normally not citing in the first time offenders. Correct. And that's why I was saying maybe using that, going closer to the states, using that for those repeat offenders. That, that would be exactly the case, And counselor. once again, going after the pet owner, not the, not the pet. Uh, that's correct. Okay. Thank you. I have a couple, <clears throat> like usual. Um, we danced around a little bit on, on uh, somewhat on the breeds of dog. The four that are vicious in Sioux Falls, what is a breed? The four dogs that are currently declared as vicious, one is a rat terrier. I don't know if you're <laughs> familiar with that breed. It's a smaller breed. The other uh, three dogs, one is a, as defined by the owners, and we have to define it by the owners because we don't currently test dogs. We don't take DNA samples from them. I can't tell you what a specific breed a dog is. Um, based upon what the owners are telling us at the time we register the dog as vicious, the other three would be either pit bulls or pit bull mixes. Okay. Explain. But what the mix would be, I, I can't say. A rat deer. Okay. Um, the, um, can, you, can you explain a situation around those four dogs very briefly? In other words, uh, what, what kind of uh, housing they lived in, what the owners were like, what kind of situation it was that they caused, if you can remember? I, most of them occurred prior to my uh, taking okay. over the animal control supervisor spot. Um, I did read the rat terrier uh, one before I came today just because I was curious. Uh, it was an incident that was basically like you described. A little girl ran up to a dog, this rat terrier, it bit her once in the face. Um, because of the nature of the injury, uh, the extent of what happened, they decided that that dog should be declared vicious, and it was. And so since that time, the owners of that animal have had to comply with all of the requirements of the city ordinance. Um, the only other one that has happened since 
I've been in charge of uh, the animal control section uh, occurred basically in the area on the southwest part of town. A pregnant lady was out walking and went by a residence where the gates to their yard were left open. Uh, their animals came out, one of those being a pit bull mix, um, <coughs> then began attacking her. A gentleman stopped in his vehicle to uh, try to help her and assist her. And at the time, the dog also attacked that gentleman that was trying to uh, help her fr get saved from the dogs. So that was something where it was more than just a dog bite. We felt it was an attack. The dog should be declared vicious. Um, they did not want to sign their dog over. They decided that they wanted to meet with all of the uh, criteria that's in the city ordinance. Um, they did comply with everything, and they were allowed to have their animal back. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, Mike. Thank you. <clears throat> now, um, Corey, Corey Beatty from the Sioux Falls Humane Society. I'm Corey Beatty from the Sioux Falls Area Humane Society. I have brought two people with me today. Pull those down a little bit. Good. All right. Um, I do have two other people with me today that are experts in the field um, as far as animal control issues regarding breeds. Um, one of those is from the Pit Bull Rescue here in Sioux Falls, Sioux Empire Pit Bull. And then we also have a person from Pet Pals here, which is a business in town that goes out and actually takes care of um, pets in the community and has a lot of experience with many, many breeds. So I'll bring those in when, when that's appropriate. It's one of the things that we did when we uh, decided to kind of look through this is get some information for you. And when we look through Sioux Falls Area Humane Society, uh, the statistics of animals, we take in probably right around 10,000 animals per year. Um, most of the time people surrender them to us. Um, they might have been seized in a field, uh, cruelty investigation of some sort, um, or abuse. Uh, and we take any animals. We're an open admission shelter. So right now we have contracts with other places that do have breed bans in place, um, but we do not honor those and we don't provide any euthanasia service with that. So there might be a city that we have contracts with that has, um, you know, certain breed bans, you know, characteristics of certain breeds. Uh, we do not honor those. If an animal um, as such is brought into the Humane Society, we do return that to the owner and the actual entity themselves are the ones that would be responsible then to deal with those owners, um, any fines associated, et cetera. As far as numbers, we went through just in the January 2011 to July 2012. This does not include the city of Sioux Falls. One of the things that really came up as kind of a shock to us, well, sort of a not, <laughs> is the animals who were not neutered um, or not altered um, as, as in spayed. So if you look at the male, 67.6% um, will be the statistic I will show you next. Um, and of those, there were only 37% of those that were neutered. So for the most part in health and veterinary science, um, non-neutered males tend to run more, um, get out in the public more, um, and females the same. 32% uh, of females, 45% of those being spayed. So it was actually the the girls did better than, than the boys in this condition, but non-spayed females, 54.5%. So we still see a lot of animals who are not altered, um, which causes um, a lot more running at large. As far as statistics, I'd like to say that none of these numbers has had an actual DNA test on the animal. So when they come into the Humane Society, our kennel staff sees them. They hear about, you know, maybe they're this kind of dog or maybe they're that kind of dog. They might not have had them since they were a puppy. Um, they might have, you know, gotten them from a shelter. So we haven't done any official DNA testing on any of these animal breeds. Um, so they could be a mixed breed. Um, and there's no proof of what that animal actually is unless you do that DNA test. 
Um, when they come in, they usually have paperwork. Um, a lot of times they'll come in and say, you know, it's a, um, you know, lab mix. Well, we don't know what that is. What's, what is it mixed with? You know, it might be mixed with Great Dane. Um, we have a dog right now that's part Basset Hound and, and, and part American Bulldog. You know, so we never know really what these animals are. So as far as just um, any general statistics, we do have um, that particular amount of animals that have um, had some sort of bite during that time period. So what we tried to do is take it out in breed. Um, so that'll give you a pretty good idea, I guess, of, you know, we see that the, the higher incidence um, percentage, you know, are 64 uh, of the total breed of boxers. You know, you, you really don't see a lot of numbers that are out of control here. Um, miniature pinchers being 5.9%, um, you know, so it's kind of across the board. Um, Pomeranians, um, we only had one, but then you say like the, 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 the poodles, three, these are all smaller dogs. But then the Labrador Retriever comes in at 13.2%. Now that could be Labrador Retrievers mixed. It could be a Labrador Retriever that's a purebred. Um, we don't know that information for sure. So these are just kind of some figures we thought you might be interested in looking at. Um, what I'd like to do is just introduce Brittany from the Sioux Empire Pit Rescue. We're gonna kind of share slides today. Um, we did work with all of these people and had a good meeting up at the Humane Society and kind of gave all of our different um, attitudes and different input from everyone because we wanted to make sure that the presentation was not only um, factual but also with experience behind it as well. So if you wouldn't mind if I do that, I'd like to introduce Brittany. Here, sure. So where's the mouse? Is it? <clears throat> My name's Brittany Snyders. I'm a volunteer with the Sioux Empire Pit Rescue. I'm sure most of you have read my email, so you know my name. <laughs> um, we know your biggest question is, is there a problem? Um, and I'm sure everybody's definition of is there a problem and what a problem is is different. Um, it is kind of a difficult question to answer because it is subjective and you have your own opinions about it. Um, but we did get some of the numbers from Animal Control. You have seen some of the numbers from the Humane Society. Um, humane officers at the Humane Society spend about 1 to 2 percent of their time um, responding to bite calls every month. So it's fairly close to what animal control is reported um, and it seems to be a fairly low number. So if that is how you measure it, um, then maybe no, there isn't a problem. Um, but there will always be dogs biting. Unfortunately, we can't eliminate that altogether. Um, <clears throat> there is no evidence hard evidence of accurate and reliable and repeatable research that shows that any breed of dog is more dangerous than another. Um, everybody has an opinion on this. Um, that's great. We should all have an opinion on it. Um, but we should also look at hard evidence, um, and there's a lot of it on both sides, and it can be hard to understand. Um, in the entire state of South Dakota, we have had dog fatalities. There have been five in this state um, since 1965. So an average of one every eight years. Um, none of those animals were fixed. As was stated before, that's a huge problem. Um, Sioux Falls itself has only ever had one dog fatality that we have found. Um, and that was quite some time ago, I believe it was in the 80s. Um, as we've said before, Defining breed is difficult, but we do know from news reports that that dog was identified as a shaggy breed, northern type dog. So it wasn't a pit bull or a Rottweiler or a Doberman, um, but it's hard to know exactly what that dog was. <clears throat> uh, breed bans are in existence in a number of areas around the country. They are difficult to enforce um, because identification, of course, is difficult. Um, Animal control doesn't have breed statistics for you because it is so difficult to know. Um, and they are, of course, expensive. So the question is, you know, is it worth it to spend all that money and should we really do it? That's a hard question to answer. Burden of proof is difficult. That is a legal issue. Um, and we see a lot of it in the media, of course. Uh, there is an existing problem of being able to address irresponsible owners. Um, we can't fix that problem, we can't legislate personal responsibility, but we can try to educate. We do have a very good vicious dog ordinance to begin with, um, and we think we can certainly discuss it and build on that ordinance. Um, of course, we do have some dogs labeled as vicious, although there aren't a significant amount. Um, irresponsible ownership needs attention. 
we know that not everybody who has a dog that bites is intentionally negligent or irresponsible. There are a lot of people who do not understand how much responsibility is involved in getting an animal and monitoring that animal and having a well-behaved animal and you don't leave it unattended. Um, but that is not always because somebody is purposely aiming towards that. Some people just don't know better. And those are the people that we can educate and those are the bites that we can prevent in the first place. And there is a lot of that. Um, if we could get some community education for children and adults, of course, um, a lot of children are involved in dog bites. Um, and a lot of those are their own dogs because they are not properly educated on monitoring that interaction between a dog and a child. Um, and especially if a dog is off lead in somebody else's yard and a children you know, run up to it or the dog is loose, that is a huge problem. Um, and education, of course, is key. That's the end of my portion. Hello, um, my name is Chad Bolstead and I'm with Pet Pals and as Corey stated, we are a pet servicing company. We go out to people's homes throughout the city. We're uh, in their homes, in the streets every day, working with all kinds of different dogs. Um, over the last year, we have worked with over 400 different types of, or 400 different dogs. And so, um, you know, with that course of business, we're all kinds of breeds, dogs, shapes, sizes, personalities, right? Um, likewise, we encounter many different types of people. Um, many different families, many different types of lifestyles. So we're really in a unique position to um, provide an, an, you know, a different um, the, the experience here of what you're going to see in dogs in different scenarios and environments. Um, through these experiences, we found that the breed of anim animal is a really poor indicator of its behavior and, and really we look to the dog's environment to assess any potential risk. Um, it's that environment that directly correlates to how they will act or react in a given situation. Uh, for example, you know, if we come across a dog that's being destructive in the home, you know, we're really going to look at increasing their exercise, consistency in that exercise, um, look at the messages that we're giving those dogs and the, in, and the consistency of those messages in order to correct that behavior. Um, we've never come across a situation where it was impossible to change the behavior of a dog just because of its breed. You know, in fact, the uh, most risky or dangerous situations that we do come across in our business has nothing to do with the dogs we're watching at all, whether it's a pit bull or a poodle. Uh, it has everything to do with people. Uh, people do not have, um, that do not have their dogs of any kind, right, properly leashed or fenced. They cause increased chances of random and oftentimes unpredictable environments for dogs and, and other people to interact. These random interactions regularly cause people to panic and or overreact, resulting in even more stressful and even more unpredictable outcomes. So in these situations, more than any other, that we experience higher potential of people and or even a dog being injured. You know, likewise, when, when people approach dogs that they don't know in a manner that is unusual for the dogs, it leads to the same type of unpredictability and unpredict an unpredictable outcome. You know, we often have people approach our dogs that we do business with just because they knew or owned a dog that looks like the breed of the dog that we're working with. You know, these people assume that because there are similarities in the way the breed looks, then this dog must act the same way as the dog that they knew or interacted with. Uh, we often find that these people are incorrect in their assumptions about the type of the breed. And moreover, these people have no understanding about the environment that our dog comes from or that the dog we're taking care of comes from. And as a result, we're forced to react as appropriate to ensure everyone's safety, right? You know, through our experiences and what we do to ensure those safeties has nothing to do with the breed of the dog and has everything to do with what we know about that specific dog and that dog's environment and what, where they come from. You know, ultimately, what we're saying here, dogs are no different from humans in that their stereotypes are far from accurate or even helpful in determining how they're going to react in a particular situation or how vicious or dangerous that they're going to be. So finally, there are a number of ways that people can be more responsible and increase safety for both dogs and humans. You know, take the time to learn about dogs, how they communicate, how we communicate with them, whether they're a dog owner or whether they don't own dogs, but they're going to put themselves in a situation where they're going to interact with dogs. It's important that they understand how to interact with an animal. You know, ensure that dogs are on leashes or properly fenced at all times when they're outdoors. Um, 
you know, spend time socializing dogs with other people and other types of dogs if they're a dog owner and, um, you know, in different types of environments so that you know how they're going to react. And, of course, providing that consistent message and the training and the reinforcement of what that dog is expected to do and what you know that dog's going to do. And then ultimately, of course, ensuring that the dogs are properly spayed or neutered is going to greatly reduce the unpredictability in how that dog's going to react. And so, again, you know, we're out there every day on the streets and in people's homes. We're dealing with these different types of dogs. And, and this is what we have found. You know, it's the environment. What has that dog been brought up in? What has that dog been trained and, and, and led to do in their lifestyle? That's how they're going to react to their situations that they're, that they're approached with. So with that, I'll give it back to Corey. And I think the, the main thing that we were really talking about through all of this is we saw some very, um, I guess they sort of stuck out to us um, as being problems if we were going to look at problems. Um, one of those, we have a lot of people in Sioux Falls that tether their animals. They put their animals on leashes, ropes, chains, um, and leave them there for hours and hours and hours at a time. I know that if I was chained or if I was roped and if I had to stay there in the same place all day long, I would probably be pretty frustrated as well and probably maybe act in a different way that I would normally not act if a person or human came by me. Same thing with bites. I think that that's very important to tell people and we try to educate people at the Humane Society. You know, little kids, they, oh, puppy. They want to run up to it. They want to get in their face. Um, they want to, hello. And, you know, if, if I look at it as this and, and as a Humane Society, I say this and I've said it to many people. If a total stranger came up and wanted to kiss you on the face, wouldn't you want to bite them? I don't know that person. I don't want them invading my space. And I think that's really super important. The second thing that we really talked about was the spay and neutering. One of the things that I think that we have, we do have a full-time veterinarian at the, at the Humane Society again now. Um, so we're trying to fix everything that we can going out the door. However, that's a very, very expensive program. And it's something that we need to get, um, and we talked with the Sioux Empire Pit Rescue folks as well. Um, that's something that we wish that we could do as a city, where we have low-cost spay-neuter clinics, um, something like that. Uh, I think uh, Mike mentioned about the licenses. Not everyone in this town that has an animal has a license. We know that now. I think that if they, that should be required. I also think that they should be required, the owners, to get a microchip in their animals so that when they do get lost, and animal control picks them up, we know whose animal that is. It's a very low cost solution. So I guess that's kind of what we're saying. There's a lot of solutions that we can use, that we can do. Um, we do have uh, backyard breeding in Sioux Falls. We have animal mills, we have hoarders. Um, all of those problems are gonna be there no matter what we do. Um, it's not a, you know, to us it's not a breed issue, but it's, it's an owner issue. And we just hope that all of this discussion comes to a close by saying, look, let's look at the owners, make them responsible, and maybe we can reduce those things that we don't want to have in our city. Thank you for letting us be a part of this. Thank you, Corey. Mm -hmm. Counselors. Counselor Karski. I only said Counselor Corey. It's an emotional issue to be sure, and you know, I, I'm convinced that it is a people issue, but I also not unconvinced it's not an animal and a specific breed issue. You don't hear of packs of rat terriers, two or three of them attacking people. You do have hear, hear news reports of certain breeds of dogs that do that. I can see where it would be very difficult and expensive to have a specific breed ban but I am not convinced that we have the perfect ordinance regarding animals on the books right now. And I think that we need to work on that. Um, specifically, maybe a tiered structure. A dog that's running at, la at large, having a different fine for one that's running and has bitten somebody. Um, I don't know if that's possible to do, but I think it would be the right thing to do. And I guess with this committee's permission, I would like to work with Jim David, our legislative and operations manager, on, on crafting, based on other communities' ordinances, something that would be more up-to-date with Sioux Falls. 
Other comments? Councillor Staggers. Yes, yeah, I, I, I thought we were supposed to be taking a look to see if we have a problem here in Sioux Falls uh, with dogs and so forth. And the presentations I've heard today is, where's the problem at? Where is the problem? Uh, the police department, as uh, indicated today, we, we already have very good ordinances. And from what I've heard, I, I agree with that totally. We have good ordinances. So where's the problem? Well, uh, you can take a look at, um, in Sioux Falls today, we have four vicious dogs. Is that a problem? I would suggest this is not a problem. We've also heard from um, the Humane Society that, you know, one dog that has bitten, not very much, Labrador Retrievers. Do we want to go after Labrador Retrievers? I think there were four bites or something. Nine? Is this a problem? I don't think it's a problem at all. But we did hear one statistic, which is you know, very unfortunate. Since 1965, in the state of South Dakota, we've had five fatalities from dogs. Now, not taking anything away from those five people who perished, that's since 1965 in the whole state of South Dakota. Do we have a problem with dogs in Sioux Falls? I would adamantly say no. What we should be doing now is this committee should be saying, upon hearing the evidence and testimony, we have determined we do not have a problem in Sioux Falls at this time, and then move on to other important issues. Councilor Anderson, Jr. <clears throat> I think we've had a lot of good conversation on this, and we've heard from the professionals. I think that you know, with all due respect, Councilman Karski, with uh, everything that I've heard today, I think if there was any changes to the ordinance that were needed, we would have heard from the professionals to do so. And I didn't hear that today. Um, the only thing that might be considered would be a, a tiered structure, you know, towards that owner. Um, but I didn't hear a problem with dogs. Um, I was a longtime owner of a, a very large animal here in Sioux Falls. For 15 years, I owned a wolf hybrid. And uh, my friends who interacted with that dog and other people still talk, tell me stories about him. So uh, I know it is how the person handles that animal. And I really, truly believe that. And I see many good people out here that work with these dogs day in and day out when they do have problems. Um, and I think that our law enforcement and our animal control have a very good handle on the ordinance that we have in place today and deal directly with the, the problem. And that problem is normally the person. Uh, so I, I don't feel that there is a problem here either, and I do agree with Councilman Staggers. Our uh, counselor, our legal counsel, would like to make a comment. Gail? Um, yes, Keith Allenstein is the assistant city attorney that's been working most closely with Sergeant Caldwell on the issue since he's the police department's legal counsel, but Keith was not able to be here today, um, and he did communicate to me, however, there is... Um, somewhat of a loophole in our current ordinance um, that doesn't cover a situation where if I'm the property owner, somebody else's dog runs onto my property and bites me, that's not really covered. So, that, I mean, and that's a pretty innocuous change that I, I, I would characterize it as that, that would, we would want to get that loophole closed. And then a second thing, Keith did have uh, communications with a citizen of Sioux Falls who had a family member that was bitten, and apparently the owner of the dog left the scene uh, of where the bite happened, and the citizen was advocating for an ordinance that required the dog owner to stay on scene. Um, and, and if a 911 call is placed, then 
it's much easier off, obviously for the officers follow through to, to know who that owner was instead of trying to track him or her down. So I would put out there, there are those two possible changes that Keith has been um, researching. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Um, Mike or, or Jerry, are there some other changes that could shore up the ordinance that you know of right now? Michael, uh, the changes that Gail talked about, I have talked to Keith about, and I do think that both of those uh, are good changes. I think the ordinances that we have currently in place are very effective with dealing with irresponsible, irresponsible owners. Um, I do think that we could have a little bit stiffer penalties for some of our ordinances um, that would allow us uh, instead of citing some of these people into court and relying upon the judges for handing out stiffer penalties, um, if we may be based upon the number of offenses that we've dealt with those people, if we were able to change the fine structure a little bit, um, I think that would assist us in dealing with those irresponsible pet owners. Um, I also think that the ordinance that Keith is talking about would be very similar to getting into a traffic crash in Sioux Falls. Uh, if you get into a traffic crash in Sioux Falls, you are uh, responsible for notifying the police department. And he's talking about if your dog bites somebody in the city of Sioux Falls, that maybe you would be responsible for notifying us of that dog bite, or at least staying on scene so that we can contact you and find out that your animal is licensed or has a rabies vaccination so that we don't have to do as much legwork in tracking these people down uh, to verify that the dog is current on its rabies vaccination. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councilor Karski. Before you leave my quick question, it's been said that we have four vicious dogs in Sioux Falls. How many vicious dogs do we um, or how many dogs are declared vicious in any given year? I couldn't give you an exact figure on how many are declared as vicious. Um, the four dogs that I spoke about, those are the four that are currently registered. There is a specific number of dogs that the owners do not want to comply with the, the, the ordinance because it is, um, there is a lot of steps that they need to go through. Those people will sign their dog over to us. Um, and then those animals will be euthanized. So there is a certain number of those cases that happen every year where we declare the dog is vicious, the owners don't want to comply and they sign the dog over to us. I don't have a specific number for you in regards to that. I wouldn't say that it's a high number where that occurs. We have um, one case that I can currently think of that's still uh, going through the court process where the people have not complied with any of the uh, ordinance requirements, and so they are currently going through the court process to, to fight that. And Mr. Mr. Anderson, oh, but do you have more? I, yeah, in a situation like that where we're just not getting compliance, would a change to our ordinance make it easier for you to get that compliance? I think we're still going through the process that needs to be done. We're, we're into the court proceedings. Um, as we all know, unfortunately, when we're working with the court system, sometimes things don't happen as fast as people would like. Um, but we are taking the proper steps, and I'm not sure that changing certain things in the ordinance would speed that process along. Um, people still have the right to appeal when we declare their dog is vicious, and I think that's a valuable right to them. Um, and so we do have to kind of go through the, the process and, and give them their opportunity to get before a judge and. Uh, give their testimony. Councilor Anderson? Um, just to continue on to that line of questioning, when a dog is declared vicious and you start that court process, the dog is kept at animal control or? We do quarantine the dogs at the Humane Society. That's who we contract with. Um, once the dog's been declared vicious, uh, the dog remains in quarantine until uh, the incident is resolved. Um, just. Last thing isn't really a question here. Um, I guess with some of the things that the city attorney has said and with our law enforcement, maybe between the two of them working with um, animal control, they could come up with the changes to the ordinance that we need. And I think those would be 
reasonable changes. I agree with Councilor Anderson uh, about these uh, changes that Gail mentioned, so long as we keep it very narrow and not trying to go off into all kinds of different directions. Agreed. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Now, here is where we're going to come down with, with public input. And I'm going to keep that very narrow, too. You see where we've come, come, we've come full circle, we've gone around, and now we're down to changing the ordinance to help make it, um, uh, to strengthen it so, so that we can not, I don't want to say penalize, but, but put the onus back on the owners. Have you guys got some ideas that would help along those lines is something we should be thinking at that the, that our um, legislative operations chair, uh, uh, person should uh, be looking at, that the uh, police should be looking at, and that's something that we should be looking at that would help us. Any specifics? And we'd be happy to take that kind of input right now. Your name uh, and Rex, your name? My name is Rachel Layton. Put down the, yeah, there we go. Um, and I'm with Sioux Empire Pitbull Rescue. I think uh, from what Mike and Andy and everybody together uh, sees over and over again that spay and neutering is a huge problem that every city needs to address. And the ones of those that have put in mandatory spay and neuter laws for dogs that are picked up running at large that might goes and, you know, those reoccurring issues, um, the owners should be mandatorily made to have those animals spayed and neutered. Um, lots of people that do not want to comply with that, they're going to sign their dogs over right there, which will be more of an intake for humane society and animal control, but you're also getting rid of the issue because if you're not willing to spay and neuter your animal and take the uh, precautions so you're not having them run at large and possibly bite somebody, then do you really deserve to have that animal anyway? Um, and then just the other thing I would say are the anti-tethering laws that Andy uh, for the Humane Society and Corey had touched base on. A dog chained uh, is a liability for anybody. Uh, 15 minutes outside on a chain to go potty with you out, not out there, shouldn't be, you know, any longer. If you want to be outside with your dog all day and the dog is chained up and you're out there having a great time with the kids, wonderful. Um, but why should any animal in South Dakota cold winters, uh, blazing hot summers be chained out for hours and hours on and nobody wants to be outside of the neighborhood and listen to the neighbor dogs bark Nobody wants to worry about their kids running into somebody's yard and you know running up and kissing that dog in the face So I really think that those are two issues that should be a strong thing that should be added into our current laws Thank you very much Rachel you. Anyone else have some ideas that we might consider as part of this uh, Strengthening this, these ordinances to make them uh, make them more make them stronger. Stephanie O'Brien, I um, I'm a firm believer in education. I'm not a teacher, probably should have been, <laughs> but I think there's, there's a lot to be learned um, from animals, and I think that uh, our children and adults um, need to have some of that teaching and that training. Um, I personally have uh, spent a lot of time um, educating kids in particular on uh, dog bite prevention, um, responsible owner, and I intend to continue to do that. Um, I would love to see you raise some of your fines and use that money in order to do more educating in the schools, in your communities, there's all kinds of opportunities. And one other thing is, even though we are all animal lovers, none of us want anyone to be harmed by an animal. So if there's an animal that is vicious, that is out of control, then yes, it should be euthanized. We don't, nobody needs that liability. I think sometimes we, see this little pack and we think, oh my gosh, there's all these people that, you know, don't, don't want any, any animal to be euthanized. But um, personally, if there's a problem that can't be solved, then yes, we don't need anybody hurt. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Stephanie. Okay. Anything else from the committee? I guess once again, oh, go ahead. Yeah, what uh, Councilor Anderson uh, mentioned earlier, and 
and I strongly support is that we just keep this so very narrow as to what uh, Gail brought up, those right. specific issues, so. Okay, I'm gonna uh, ask uh, Jim David uh, uh, to work with Gail on uh, putting an ordinance and Mike uh, to put an ordinance together. Keith. <laughs> that, Keith. Or Keith. And Keith. That one's oh, okay, with Keith rather, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, to put uh, a draft ordinance together for our um, next meeting. And would that be enough time, Jim? Okay, and um, so that we can look at that, taking into consideration all the things that we've talked about today. And um, could I, uh, I guess I can just do that and we can take a look at it next time and, and work it through. Uh, all of you, thank you very much. That worked out very, very nicely. And uh, we thank you for your time and your energy and your love for animals and your uh, love for the city of Sioux Falls because that's why we're all here is uh, not only for the love of those animals but also for the to make Sioux Falls a much better place to live for everybody. Um, last thing on the agenda is uh, discussion, open discussion. Is there any open discussion? Hearing none, meeting is adjourned.